My name is Dan Washburn, and I'm the author of The Forbidden Game, Golf and the Chinese Dream. I've been working on this project for more than seven years, and it's always been called a book about golf in China. And obviously that's what it is, but I also think it's much more than that. In many ways, I think it's a portrait of modern China. It may seem a little strange that a activity enjoyed by statistically 0% of the Chinese population would be a good window through which to look at China. But I have found that the complicated world surrounding the game is uh, really a microcosm of the country as a whole. Um, the rise of golf in China is a barometer for China's economic growth, but it also touches on a lot of issues at the core of China today, uh, rural land rights issues, the growing gap between rich and poor, uh, this Wild West real estate development, um, corruption, environmental issues, and plenty of political intrigue. China has long had a difficult relationship with golf. The sport was banned in 1949 when Mao and the communists came to power. He denounced it as the sport for millionaires and a lot of the existing courses were repurposed and dug up. Um, the Shanghai Hongqiao Golf Club is now the home of the Shanghai Zoo. Um, Golf didn't get reintroduced in China until 1984, 30 years ago, but it still has, uh, it's still a politically taboo topic because it remains prohibitively expensive to play the game. And uh, you're in a nation with nearly a billion people living on less than $5 a day, 700 million peasant farmers. So it's not an activity that the central government um, wants to eagerly embrace. So in fact, since 2004, there's been a moratorium on golf course construction. But over that decade, China has built more golf courses than any country in the world. So it really shows the disconnect that exists between Beijing and out in the provinces. There's a, uh, a good saying, um, old Chinese saying, called the mountain is high and the emperor is far away that really shows this disconnect. The local governments in China often want this kind of development. They feel it brings in a well-heeled clientele. It attracts business, brings them tax revenue. Uh, but most importantly, the local governments want land-hungry developments like golf because they're the ones who own the land and they profit mightily from these developments. So the, uh, the local governments are willing to, to fudge the rules or simply ignore them to allow this kind of development to persist. Rule number one when building a golf course in China these days is not to call it a golf course. I didn't want the book to be a, a dry nonfiction uh, work. I always wanted it to feel alive. I wanted it to have more show than tell. So I decided to make it a, a character-driven book. And there are three men at the heart of the narrative. Um, there's Wang. He's a villager in Hainan province, um, an island in southern China. And his life is turned upside down when a huge golf development moves in next door to his ancient village. The development is actually one and a half times the size of Manhattan and planned to be the largest golf complex in the world by far. And a lot of the villagers, like Wong, had to give up some land um, that they worked with uh, lychee trees. They farmed lychee trees and they had to give up this land for the development. And his story really shows how adaptable um, rural residents in China need to be in the face of this breakneck development that seems to be happening everywhere. Um, and he also, his story shows, I think, kind of the entrepreneurial spirit that exists in a, in a lot of the Chinese people I've met in rural China. And then there's also Martin, an American 
working in the golf construction industry who was building a lot of these courses. And I think he, he is a, an intelligent pragmatist. He shows readers how to navigate this uh, complex business and political climate that exists in China where new golf courses are at once banned and booming. Um, he's really, he doesn't wear a suit, but he's really, I think, a, a China business expert of sorts. And he can give a, a real ground level, literally ground level view of, of how things are um, in China these days. And then there's Joe. He's the professional golfer. Um, he went from his inspiring underdog story goes from peasant farmer to security guard to professional golfer. And I think he really embodies uh, this Chinese dream. He's got one foot in the past that's represented by his, his poor mountain village in Guizhou province and his, his parents who are, are tied to that land. And one foot in this more modern and materialistic future. Um, and it's an interesting balance he has to walk between those, those two worlds as he tries to, uh, tries to emerge as a member of, of China's new middle class. What's interesting to me is that um, all of these men, I mean, they have some things in common. They're all very hard workers. And they all stumbled into this bizarre golf scene in China by accident. And now they are trying to figure out how to how to use it to, to realize their dreams.